most Americans right now are worried about their jobs. They're worried about keeping them. They're worried about job conditions, even if they do keep them. They're worried about their salaries, and they're worried about the prices that they have to pay with whatever salary they get. So to say it's in balance, if you meant by that people are secure and comfortable in the situation they're in, then I have no idea what Mr. Powell is talking about. I do understand what he is doing. His job is to manage what I would call the contradictions of capitalism, the tendency of the system on one hand to produce inflation and on the other to produce recession and the oscillation between b inflation and recession, otherwise called the business cycle, uh, is a problem that capitalism has had from its beginning and that it has never been able to solve. And the closest it's come is to create central banks and monetary authorities and to give them the job of minimizing whatever inflation happens and minimizing whatever recession happens. That's all they do. They can't obliterate them. They can't overcome them. They can't make them go away, which is what everybody wishes. The working class wishes it. The employer class wishes it. Nobody wants the cycles to keep happening. And yet, let's just take a look. This is a new century. We're 24 years into the 21st century. We've had an economic downturn in this U.S. capitalism in the spring of the year 2000, again in the autumn of the year 2008, again in the year 2020, and we are now facing a decline that looks like it's the beginning of the next downturn. Every four to seven years, we have a crash or a downturn or a recession. We have lots of words because we have this experience over and over again. Now, I would say an economy that has had this problem, that knows it has this problem, where everybody agrees it would be better if we didn't have this problem, and yet can't solve it. The fact of the matter is that the Federal Reserve, the agency that Mr. Powell heads, permitted this inflation to happen. They're not supposed to have that happen. And before that, they permitted the recession of 2020, which is one of the worst recessions the United States has ever had. So their ability to prevent this is uh, zero. They can't. And so now they're scrambling before the next one hits. That's not a recipe to say the economy is in great shape. No, no, it isn't. But now let's get to the deeper question. Why isn't it? Well, for the last 40 years, at least since the early 1980s, the inequality of income and wealth in the United States has grown steadily worse. Whether you measure it by the Gini coefficient, which is what economists use, or any one of a dozen other ways of looking at the statistics, everybody, and I mean nearly everybody, sees the growing gap between rich and poor. Okay, so that means you, you're sitting now in the year 2024 on a U.S. capitalism that has had 40 years of unstable business cycle oscillation, and on top of it, growing inequality. And as if that weren't enough, for the first time in a century, the United States has a major global economic competitor namely the People's Republic of China. And the G7, that's the United States and its allies, is now a smaller economic unit by output, by wealth, than China and the BRICS, which is the other unit power in the world. I mean, that's a completely new situation. Every country on Earth, including the United States, is adjusting to this new situation. That's why the dollar is going down as you referenced a few moments ago. That's why many of the other things we see and experience are happening because of this confluence of an unstable, unequal, seriously competitive environmental set of conditions for the United States. I'm not saying that we are about to collapse. I'm not saying that there's no way out. I'm not doing that. 
But I am saying, let's look soberly and honestly at what the problems are, the, bi the big ones. And not let's not get caught up in all the little ups and downs. I mean, you referenced one yourself. If you look at the latest numbers, well, goodness, the employment isn't so bad. But then when you notice that they've had to revise last month and the month before, and those revisions saw the disappearance of what we thought were hundreds of thousands of jobs, well, then you begin to understand the larger picture is not the rose-colored image you're likely to encounter in most media today. I'm afraid I do. And I, let me expand a little bit on what Powell said. There's another statistic that came out, a statistic that measures the percentage of office space in the United States that is empty, vacant, that is not being rented by any kind of business venture, okay? And the interesting thing about that is it is at over 20% which is very, very high by historical standards. But even more important, it is all of the problems of the pandemic, which we thought might be behind us, now that the worst of the pandemic is a year or two behind us, has not worked out. The latest few years since the end of the pandemic, or the last two or three years, the empty office space is getting worse not better. And here's the reason. Most office space, not all, but most of it, is in the hands of uh, renters who have multi-year leases. Typical leases in commercial sector are between five and ten years. This is very important because it means that the landlord can go into court even if a business is failing, even if a business has collapsed, and try to get the rental that the lease requires the renter to pay. The crisis for the landlord is only when the lease is over, because then you can't go after your renter. You have to find a new renter, and that's exactly what there is not any of. And so now you go to your bank and you say to your bank as a landlord, my renters are at the end of their lease. I'm not getting any rent. I can't get any rent. Even if they're going bankrupt, I have no claim on any assets anymore. So I can't pay the loan that you, the bank, gave me to become the landlord of this property. That's what's unfolding now. That's why Mr. Powell is talking about years. Most of the leases in place at the time of the pandemic have not yet ended. And so we, we are waiting for those renters to be telling their landlords, I'm not giving you another nickel because the lease is over and my business is impossible. So if you want me to stay, you're going to have to give me a rental half of what you charged me before or else I'm leaving because there's lots of empty space where people are desperate. This situation, we are not even halfway through. And therefore, the banks that are already making arrangements to wait are discovering that the wait isn't going to pay the bills. Even if they wait a year and allow a landlord not to be forced out because they can't pay the rent, the idea that in six months or 12 months, I will have that rental back, that is now disappearing. And the great anxiety of all medium and small banks around the country, and quite a few big ones, is when does this situation, which is already bad and which is already getting worse, when will it get to the point where we are seeing banks collapse, where we are seeing banks unable to meet their obligations because the landlords to whom they've lent so much money cannot meet theirs. And the interesting thing to point out is that at this point, everybody's waiting. Nothing is happening. There's no national plan for this situation. There's no bank sector plan for how to deal with it. Or maybe, let me put it this way. The only plan is to let it collapse 
and then turn to the government the way they did in 2008 and 9 and the way they did in 2020 and declare a disaster and then hope the government comes in and bails them out. But the popular tolerance for that is less now because now when people say, how many times are we going to bail out the banks? The answer has to be very different from what it was before. So bottom line, Mr. Powell is right. It's not just that it's going to last for years. That's for sure. But how bad it will get, how disruptive it will be, nobody knows. And I am not aware of anything like a plan for how to deal with this. Last point. If we are, as Mr. Powell hinted, going into a recession now, as unemployment rises, as job numbers go down, as we see the usual signs, well, then you have to see a downturn on top of this office vacancy problem that adds yet another burden on a system that does not look like it's in anything like the shape needed to absorb that. I believe that's a consensus point of view, left wing, right wing, center, it doesn't really matter. Everybody realizes that the bank consolidation we saw uh, with the Silicon Valley Bank a couple years ago, with the First Republic Bank in New York and California, those were very large banks. They had been thought to be very secure. First Republic is a bank that deals really only with wealthy people and, and, and very stable corporate uh, entities. Silicon Valley Bank, which is in the middle of the most profitable sector of the U.S. economy. For those two banks to have been wiped out by interest rate movements, which is basically what they weren't prepared for, suggests to you that a much broader phenomena encompassing many more parts of the country and many more banks like the commercial loan industry, that that is going to have very serious disruptive uh, impact. And my guess is that the solution found for Silicon Valley Bank and for First Republic Bank will be found even quicker and easier for the many small and medium banks who are already consolidating because many of them can see it coming. And if you see that wave coming, it's a little bit like a tsunami. It, you'll, you'll get a better deal if you make your merger now than if you make it after half of your deposits are gone.